For the first time ever, the untold story of the Scott Peterson investigation. Newly released transcripts, startling never-before-seen photographs, and exclusive interviews. Scott Peterson, A Deadly Game, a Court TV special presentation, now. <laughs> Tonight, the untold story, how investigators brought Scott Peterson to justice. First officers had a gut feeling. Did you murder your wife? The clues. Amber, did you know that Scott was a married man? We did have a romantic relationship. The suspicion. I mean, it was just unbelievable how many lies this guy told. The evidence. We have not eliminated the fact that it may be a female victim. The only thing that always stood the test of suspicion was Scott. Scott Peterson. Today we know he perpetrated one of the most notorious crimes in recent years, the murder of his pregnant wife Lacey and his unborn child. I covered the Scott Peterson case from beginning to end and in my book A Deadly Game I wrote about the meticulous work of these investigators. Tonight we'll go behind the scenes and behind the headlines to see exactly how they solved this mystery and hear for the first time about the painstaking police work that brought a killer to justice. April 13, 2003, the intact body of a baby boy washes up on the shore of San Francisco Bay. The next day, one mile to the south, the badly decomposed torso and lower body of a woman washes up, clad in a nursing bra and maternity pants. The body is an adult female, and as we speak right now, the autopsy is being performed. The bodies are those of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son, missing for almost four months. It confirms the worst fears of a nation riveted by this case. It was a mystery that began four months earlier. Christmas Eve, 2002, Modesto, California. 5.17 p.m., Scott Peterson calls Sharon Rocha to tell her that her daughter Lacey is missing. They're expected at Sharon's for dinner in just a little while. Lacey is eight months pregnant and always reliable. She would never just disappear. Something seems terribly wrong. Lacey was very conscientious, very calculated person. I, I knew something was wrong. At 5.47, Lacey's stepfather calls the Modesto police to make a missing persons report. Normally, authorities would wait 24 to 48 hours to start a search. Modesto Police Chief Roy Wasden reveals for the first time why in this particular instance, his men make an exception. This is an adult missing person, eight months pregnant, um, can find no reason for her to be missing, none at all. One of the big things is the victim profile and looking at your victim, especially with the circumstances you have here, holidays coming up family plans, get-togethers, um, being pregnant, getting ready to give birth. Um, that showed us that, you know, she didn't go to Cleveland and, you know, start doing drugs. The police arrive at the Peterson house and start questioning Scott. He claims Lacey was planning to walk their dog in a local park that morning, and he went fishing on San Francisco Bay. And then he does something that astonishes police. Unasked, he pulls out his parking receipt. Is he establishing an alibi already? Detective Brocchini reveals what else detectives find fishy. He couldn't say what he was fishing for. He didn't know what kind of bait he was using initially to the first officers. Um, they, they just had, they had that, you know, cop gut instinct that, you know, something just isn't right. Here at the Peterson house, it didn't take long for investigators to become suspicious of Scott's behavior. He just wasn't acting the way a husband would if his pregnant wife turned up missing. The first officers had a gut feeling and they told the sergeant. So he calls a watch commander who says, we need a detective. The call comes to my home on Christmas Eve and really it's for me a, a feedback of here's what we're being told, here's what we see, here's what our concerns are, here's what we believe we need to do immediately. Detective Rokini handles the investigation from day one, arriving at the Peterson house at 9.25 p.m. It's been four hours since the missing persons call came in, 
but already police are treating Lacey's disappearance as suspicious. When you approach Scott, uh, tell me about that first encounter. I just introduced myself to him and I told him that I was, you know, going to be there to help and I asked him if he would walk me through his day and walk me through his house. Over the next four hours, Rokini does an intensive search of Scott Peterson's house and property. But it's Scott's odd reactions that really pique his interest. For example, when he accidentally bumps the door of Scott's truck into Lacey's car. And he came right over with a glove that he was wearing and he says, look, either move, I'll move my truck or I'll hold this glove in there so you don't scratch my car. And I, was, I said, I'll be careful, don't worry. What did the, the putting of the glove between the, the vehicles say to you? He just said his major concern wasn't Lacey. By evening, the hunt is on for Lacey. Helicopters, officers, and search dogs all comb the area. That night, Scott's father-in-law tells police that Scott told him he'd been golfing that day. But didn't he already tell police he'd been fishing? It's a direct conflict, and it's not lost on investigators. He would fabricate things or, you know, lie about things that he didn't have to. And we never really were able to figure out exactly why uh, he did it. As Brocchini inventories Scott's house and cars, he continues making mental notes of all the things that bother him. Among them, after Scott came home, he took his time before alerting anyone that Lacey was missing. First, he washed the clothes he'd worn that day. Then he had a snack, showered, and changed his clothes. Detectives find this strange for a man desperate to locate his wife. But more than anything, it's the laundry that catches Brokini's attention. Why would Scott only wash his own clothes when there was a basket full of dirty laundry in his bedroom and a pile of dirty rags right on top of the washer? I saw these big dirty rags and I couldn't see anything in the house that how they could be that dirty and what are they doing on the washing machine and why do he wash his clothes? Then there is Scott's claim that Lacey had planned to walk the dog in a local park that morning. Police just don't buy it. Well, there's a rather steep incline for a pregnant gal who's not feeling good, not moving good, not very athletic at that stage of her pregnancy to take the dog and go down there. That seemed unreasonable to us. In Scott's truck, the detective finds brand new fishing gear still in the package, patio umbrellas, tarps, and a toolbox. It's only five hours now since Lacey was reported missing. But police have already stopped treating this like a missing persons case. In their gut, they think it's a homicide, and they begin treating it like one. They take crime scene photos, and one of them grabs their attention. It shows a comforter that looks like a body was laid across it. Something else. Lacey's jewelry and purse are there, and they are told she always took those with her. Just a lot of little things like that that just... He made me think that, you know, we, you know, we're doing the right thing. We're heading in the right direction, at least looking into this case. At 11.17, the detective and another officer accompany Scott to his office. Scott's a fertilizer salesman operating out of a warehouse in an industrial section of Modesto. There, Brocchini finds a 14-foot boat, a homemade anchor, and signs that more anchors had been made. Could they have been used to weigh down Lacey's body in the bay? Finally, at midnight, they go back to headquarters where Detective Brocchini formally interviews Scott Peterson, recording every word he says. But if Scott is scared or distraught, he certainly doesn't show it. I asked him to sit down. I went into the viewing room to plug in a tape, and I could see him. He was sitting there with his hands in his pocket, and he's almost like leaning back in his chair. You made notes about his behavior during the course of the interview, you know, sort of callous, um, laid back. <sighs> Given your experience, that body language, that behavior has to be telling you an awful lot. What it told me was that I need to ask more questions and we need, I need to call in a couple more detectives. You know, this is suspicious. She's not out at shopping and not showing up. I mean, something bad's happened to Lacey in my stomach. I, that's what I felt. The story hasn't even been reported yet, but already, just hours into the case, Scott Peterson is under the Modesto police microscope. Christmas 
Christmas Day 2002. It's been just 24 hours since Lacey Peterson's disappearance. You recognize her from this picture? And already the word is out and hundreds of people in Modesto, California are searching for the pregnant 27-year-old. Lacey's friends and family don't know it at the time, but the police are already starting to build a murder case against her husband, Scott Peterson. Scott does seem emotionally detached. At the time, those around him figure it's just his way of coping. Yeah, no problem at all. His parents had their own explanation. He showed emotion, but he didn't cry 24 hours a day. He cried privately. He worked at trying to find her. He um, tried to keep us up, you know, by because we were breaking down too, so he tried to be brave for us. Did you ever get that, that pleading? You know, I didn't do this. I couldn't do this. I loved my wife. No, I never heard that from him, but, you know, if, if this had been me, and this were my husband missing, I mean, I'd be crying on the streets. In fact, Scott's half-sister, Ann Bird, had always distrusted his fishing story, knowing all the things Lacey would have had him do on a big holiday. On Christmas Eve, when I heard that Scott was out fishing, I thought, gosh, you know, how could that be? He would have a honey-do list a mile long. The fishing and Scott's strange emotion Modesto investigators find both suspicious, but that's not all. Detective Al Brocchini has never said this publicly, but he is astounded on Christmas Day when Scott asks a bizarre question. Would grief counselors be made available to Lacey's family? Not even a day had passed since they reported her missing. I told him, Scott, it's Christmas. I don't think I can get you somebody today. And if we find Lacey, you're not going to need anybody. And, you know, he responds like, well, I'm going to need somebody. We're going to need somebody, or Sharon is, you know. It's like he already knew we weren't going to find Lacey. It's one day now since the search for Lacey began. Her family She's hits the airwaves in a desperate appeal for help. Get her home safely and run. Run from us. We don't care. Just get her back to us. It's strange. Lacey's mother is obviously clinging to hope, but Scott already seems to be bracing for the worst. The exhaustive searches with the police and with friends and family have not discovered her, so we have to look at our possibilities. 48 hours after the missing persons report comes in, police make the hour and a half trip to the Berkeley Marina to check out Scott's fishing alibi. He told police it was raining on the bay on Christmas Eve, but no one else reports even a drop. So now police have caught Scott in a blatant lie. And yet another red flag goes up. Then on Christmas Day, Scott backs out of a polygraph test he promised to take. This has to put Chief Roy Wasden and his men on high alert. But two findings that are even more damning to Scott Peterson. First, investigators discover he bought his boat without telling anyone. Then they learn he researched the tides and currents of San Francisco Bay on his computer. Could he have been trying to figure out the best spot to dump a body? In fact, he was searching those bay tides before Lacey was missing, like the day he bought the boat. It was another little piece. As police execute the search warrant, they see that Scott's moved things around in the two days since Lacey disappeared. In his warehouse, they see that the homemade anchor is still there. So is something else that turns out to be incriminating. A pair of pliers with a black hair clamped inside. Detective Brocchini and his colleagues realize they've now got something that they needed desperately. A potential piece of forensic evidence against Scott. It was one of those days where we're all sitting around and thinking, gosh, what, what are we going to do now? Kind of a thing. We need something and we see this picture of this hair and it's not like a transfer hair it's in the pliers the chief of police has told us this is a priority and in those first days lacy's family remains in the spotlight neighbor. looking for anything that might help them find her have some compassion she's a human being she's pregnant she needs to take care of her baby on december 27th they hold a press conference and make a tearful plea for her safe return Whoever has her, please, please, please let her go. Bring her back. We to love us. her so much. We want her back. 
please, can let us have her back. While publicly the police are pressing their search for Lacey, privately they're sure she's already dead. And they're slowly piecing together their theory of exactly what happened to her and why. I think she was getting ready for bed and she got strangled or smothered right there, wrapped in a tarp, drug out and put in the truck. I think the umbrellas went in first and she went in second in a blue tarp. I mean, he wanted an excuse to be carrying something that big in a blue tarp and that's what the umbrellas were his excuse. He just didn't want to be a dad. He didn't want to be tied down. He, I mean, just when you look at his lifestyle, all the things that he wanted to do and, you know, being a member of the country club, um, parenting was going to be you know, a big anchor on him. My opinion is, his plan is wake up in the morning, leave, people are going to think I'm golfing, but go, nobody will be at the bay, do my thing. But there's a hitch when several people spot him at the bay. That's when police say Scott Peterson changes his alibi from golfing to fishing. Whatever his story, police are now sure foul play is involved that Scott Peterson is responsible and that it was premeditated. I mean, he's been planning it. Planned it when he bought the boat. And his plan was, I'm going golfing, but the real plan, take Lacey to the bay, get rid of her, come back, and I was golfing. Police don't know it yet, but a new player is about to break the case wide open. How long have you been seeing Scott? December 30th, 2002. Six days since Lacey Peterson was reported missing, and now a huge break. A woman calls into the police tip line claiming to be Scott Peterson's lover. Her name is Amber Fry. Modesto Police Chief Roy Wasden and his men recall how that one tip changed everything. What was the reaction in the department when Amber Fry called in? It was a significant break. Um, it was important to get a, a more full picture of Scott Peterson, uh, who he was, what he did, how he behaved. In that one paragraph tip, she had too much information to be a nut. I mean, she knew too much. Investigators don't waste a second. They drive straight to Fresno to meet Amber. Detective John Bueller knows it right away. This is a major score for the investigation. I mean, it was a great meeting. Uh, it, it yielded a tremendous amount of information. Um, Amber seemed to be um, naturally a young girl. Um, I wouldn't say naive, but maybe idealistic in love and romance, things like that. Amber tells the detective she's been seeing Scott Peterson only a few weeks, but they're already talking marriage. On December 9th, she recalls, he broke down sobbing that he had, quote, lost his wife. That's the same day Scott secretly bought his boat. Detective Brocchini knows he's on to something. I mean, he told Amber that he had lost his wife when she wasn't lost. And so that, I mean, to me, that was a key. The detectives ask Amber to secretly record all future conversations with Scott. She agrees. They're also determined that no one will find out about her. That afternoon, the detectives take Amber to buy the recording equipment. And then her phone rings. It's Scott. He's caught everyone off guard. I was shaking so, like, I was so fumbly. I mean, I dropped, I dropped the earpiece and I'm, I'm scrambling. But there was no conversation at that time, thankfully, because I was so... That's the word. Rattled? Rattled. Uh, you know, I was just frazzled. Really frazzled and really nervous. To be like in Radio Shack, buying the equipment for her phone, and we're walking out, and her phone is ringing, and it's him. I mean, I could see the caller ID. I know his phone number by heart. Scott calls Amber often, and he has no idea she's taping every word. He lies over and over in these calls, sometimes making up outrageous stories. On New Year's Eve, Scott is in Modesto at a candlelight vigil for his missing wife. Yet he calls Amber and claims to be in Paris. Amber, hey, happy New Year. Happy New Year. I wanted to call you. Thank you. I'm uh, near the Eiffel Tower. New Year's celebration is unreal. The crowd is huge. The crowd's huge? Amber, if you're there, I can't hear you right now, but I'll call you on your New Year's. Okay. Amber, Amber, miss you. 
The photo of the vigil makes the front page the next day, and if the public thinks Scott Peterson is showing his concern, the police know otherwise. We saw the picture on the front page of the B, and he's at the vigil, but we know what he's saying on the phone. He's in Paris, you know, or jogging on the cobblestones or eating with, you know, somebody. On New Year's Day, the Modesto police held a press conference in which they said it was becoming apparent that Lacey's disappearance was the result of foul play. What they didn't say was that the investigation was beginning to focus on Scott Peterson as the main suspect. By January 4th, 10 days after Lacey was reported missing, the police have Scott Peterson under 24-hour surveillance, but the public doesn't know it. Throughout January, police divers continue to comb the bay. They're sure that's where Scott has dumped his pregnant wife. But what if her body doesn't turn up? Chief Roy Wasden discloses now what he couldn't back then. Body or no body, police are still pushing forward with their case against Scott Peterson. Was the department ever prepared to seek an arrest warrant before the body surfaced? Yes. Uh, in fact, the detectives had worked and discussed extensively with the district attorney's office what, it, what would be required for what's known as a no-body homicide warrant. And, uh, and we're moving in that direction prior to the discovery of the bodies. Hello? Amber. Yes. Scott continues to call Amber. And detectives are intent on getting him to repeat something he told her just before Lacey disappeared. Those four short but incriminating words, I lost my wife. You came and told me this elaborate lie about her missing and this tragedy and that... No. And that, that this will be the first holidays without her? I never said, Amber, I, I, God, I don't want to fight with you. Well, you know that I, I never said tragedy or missing. Oh, yes, you said you've lost your wife. No. That, said, obviously, that, yes. Obviously without me saying much, but we will... I talk said that I lost my wife. Yes, you did. I did. Bingo. This is what investigators needed. For us, that was a huge statement on his part because uh, how do you, how do you, predict that. I mean, how do you, you know, you're going to come up with a lie about that to try and woo some girl into a romance that you're not supposed to be part of, and then all of a sudden it comes true? I mean, the odds of that are, are pretty far out there. The calls continue, and Scott's lies pile up. At one point, he tells Amber he's taken a polygraph and passed it. And then, an even bolder lie. Not only did Lacey know about his relationship with Amber, but she accepted it. Detectives can't believe what he's trying to get away with. It really was the ultimate chess game with him, uh, trying to anticipate his you know, next move and what he was going to do and, and listen to what he was saying and compare it with the facts and just documenting it. I mean, it was just unbelievable how many lies this guy told. The police already know about Scott's lies. Now, finally, the public will too. January 13th, 2003, 20 days since Lacey Peterson's disappearance. Police learn that the National Enquirer is about to break an explosive story exposing Scott Peterson's secret life. It will reveal that Scott Peterson had a mistress while Lacey was alive and pregnant. The once close relationship between Scott and Lacey's family is now severed forever. And it's only days before the press and the public find out who Scott's mystery woman is. Amber, did you know that Scott was a married man? On January 24th, exactly one month since Lacey was reported missing, her husband's lover is forced into the glare of the spotlight. I met Scott Peterson November 20th, 2002. I was introduced to him. I was told he was unmarried. Scott told me he was not married. We did have a romantic relationship. This is devastating news for Lacey's mother. It basically allowed Sharon to realize her worst fears had come true. Because until then, she had nothing to, you know, hang her suspicions on. There was nothing that she knew, of course we did, that would confirm for her that, you know, Lacey probably wasn't coming back. The same day Amber comes forward, the Roaches make their own public statement. I would like Scott to know that I trusted him and stood by him in the initial phases of my sister's disappearance. However, Scott has not been forthcoming with information regarding my sister's disappearance, 
and I'm only left to question what else he may be hiding. And even as Lacey's family wonders what happened to her, the police are sure Scott knows. On January 26th, he's tracked to the Berkeley Marina where he sits in his car gazing at the water. This is at least the fifth trip he's made to that location. What about all the trips to the, to the Berkeley Marina? He didn't stay very long. He didn't sit up there and watch the diving teams. What do you think he was doing? Who knows? I mean, because he is so different from, from us. Um, curiosity as to where we were, uh, where the searches were taking place, how close they were to where he left her, um, maybe to ease his mind. If he, if he went up there long enough and he saw we weren't close to where she was, oh, okay, no reason to stick up here anymore. We'll just go back home. That's the only way that I can make sense out of that. But media interest in the case is white hot now, and Scott can no longer ignore it. The allegations of a girlfriend. With his infidelity public knowledge, he decides to spin it on national TV. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no. I just thought. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And January 28, 2003. It's been over a month since Lacey disappeared. Now, Scott sits with Diane Sawyer on Good Morning America, and police are watching for what he says and how he says it. Amber Fry came forward. I'm glad she did. Did you tell her that you were not married? I did. I did. Um, and then when uh, Lacey disappeared, um, I called her and admittedly it wasn't immediately. It was a couple days after Lacey's disappearance. I telephoned her and told her the truth. The truth? That I was married, that Lacey had disappeared. She didn't know about it at that point. But Amber told investigators that she found out Scott was married from news reports, not from Scott. It was pretty powerful to see him, see his words, see uh, his lies. How harmful do you think Scott's own words were to him? I think very harmful. I, I do. I think, that, well, I think they painted a true picture of Scott Peterson, which was, you know, pretty indicting of who he is. In the mornings, I've been taking the dog down to the park where she walked. And that's, that's like our time. And they see nice time together. When he began to cry, and something I thought was, was very strange was most men, I would expect, even women, will try and wipe away tears. And he, he sat there and let those flood uh, without ever reaching up. That just kind of goes to what we had expected all along with him. Uh, I mean, here's somebody, he, he wants people to see those tears. I mean, he, he, I, I would imagine it probably took some effort for him to squirt those out. You know, let the camera roll and let's capture those. And maybe that's going to help me later on down the line. Investigators aren't the only ones paying close attention to this interview. Amber Fry is too. Were you in love with her? No. What did you think about when you saw the Diane Sawyer interview where she asked him if he loved you and he said no? It's funny because Scott and I talked about that and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I know, they cut it off. He said, because they cut out all the other things I said about you. I was like, really? Obviously, I care about you. I mean, there's no question. You know, he excused it, but certainly I knew, you know, I knew better than that. By now, five weeks since Lacey's disappearance, police are looking for any credible leads. One big one, a car dealer tells them that Scott sold Lacey's Land Rover and bought a new pickup truck. Why would he do that? And that's not all. Now two other women come forward claiming affairs with Scott Peterson. I talked to him, and uh, they were all similar. He used the same, the same approach, and it worked, obviously. Uh, you know, flowers and gifts, and he's a great guy, and he wasn't married, and he lied to all of them, and, you know, he tricked all of them, but when they caught him, and they dumped him. The circle of suspicion around Scott is tightening, but investigators are still hunting other leads. 6,000 tips on the case have come in, but none exonerate their chief suspect. None of those things had any merit. The only thing that, that always stood the test of suspicion was Scott. February 1st, 2003. 
just over one month into the Lacey Peterson case. Scott Peterson has already backed out of taking a police polygraph test, but now he tells Amber he'll go to an office where he can take a private one. She should meet him there in half an hour. So, you know, of course I'm talking with Modesto police that like to not absolutely do not meet him. We'll see, you know, if, you know, maybe he'll just go ahead and do it without you. For her safety, Amber stays behind, but Detective Brokini goes ahead and stakes out the location of the polygraph. I was sitting watching this building from about three blocks away and all of a sudden in my rearview mirror I see Scott Peterson walking up behind me. So I got out and he just walked right up to me like we're f friends and thanked me for going on America's Most Wanted, trying to find Lacey and, you know, shook my hand. I mean, it was just the weirdest contact. You know, here I'm in a different town, I'm staking out a place where he's going to go and his thing is, hey, thanks for going on America's Most Wanted. At this point in the investigation, police ask Amber to stop recording Scott's calls. They're worried that anything more Amber might say could be used to discredit her in court. But wiretaps show that Scott kept calling. Is there some way for us to see each other, Amber? I think it would help us so much. At this point, all I could see is it just damaging me even more. What did you think when he called you in February? All of this is broken loose. People are really, by this point, looking very intensely at Scott, and he calls and says, come to Lake Arrowhead with me. Mm -hmm. I really had to talk, my, talk that whole situation out because he was being very persistent and very emotional about seeing me, that he needed to see me. I can't say I understand, but okay. Scott. You know I've got a monster effort. I never said you were Scott. I don't, but you know I could never hurt you or hurt anyone. February 10th would have been Lacey's due date. That night, friends and family hold a candlelight vigil, and police note that Scott is conspicuously absent. But it's also Amber's birthday, and Scott does reach out to her. Tell me about this surreptitious birthday drop. Right. Tell me about that. There was a bush that he had a package under, and, you know, he described where it was at and what light post. You know, there was the CD, Come Away With Me. Come away with me and we'll kiss on a mountain top. You know, it was a little bit almost morbid thinking, you know, your wife's missing and you're sending me the CD that has a great meaning and thought involved to it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. By now, a month and a half since Lacey disappeared, Scott's family seems to be his only defenders. Three days after the vigil, they hold a press conference in San Diego to show their support. Yeah, Scott is looking for Lacey. That is his whole purpose. And he's continued to do that since day one. Investigators note that Scott is absent from the press conference, too. But he's busy at home on February 18th when police arrived to serve a second search warrant. When you went back with a second search warrant, I understand that cops knocking on the door, and boy, he's on the phone trying to cancel some porn channels. What did you think about that? For him to be so cold and so able to switch gears and distance himself from this tragedy to the fact that he has to order porn at home, it's just another piece of evidence that shows us that he wasn't concerned about her, didn't want to be a part of her, didn't want to have her in his life, and was so far down the road from moving on that uh, he could order that. Eight weeks in, the public is still gripped by this story, and calls continue to flood the Modesto Police Department. Investigators have received more than 8,000 tips by the end of February. Then a real break in early March. Forensic testing proves what the police thought all along, the hair found in the pliers on Scott's boat is consistent with the hair from Lacey's hairbrush. That's the piece that puts it over the top. On March 5th, the police officially reclassify this case a homicide. As this investigation has progressed, we have increasingly come to believe that Lacey Peterson is a victim of violent crime. But there's still a big problem for the police. They're faced with proving a homicide without a body, They'll just have to keep working the circumstantial evidence. And their sole suspect, Scott Peterson. By now, even some of his family are turning against him. Things really did not add up. 
over and over again. And my husband kept saying, he has to be guilty. This is just not normal behavior. Then on April 13th, a gruesome discovery on the northern shore of San Francisco Bay. It's the body of an unborn child. The next day, just one mile south, another body washes ashore. After nearly four months of working a no-body case, it looks like investigators have what they need to name Scott Peterson. When the bodies came up, there was no doubt in my mind, we had the right guy. April 13th, 2003, the battered body of a baby boy is found on the northern shore of San Francisco Bay. The next day, the remains of a second body is found on the shoreline just one mile south. We have a pretty badly decomposed body that appears to have been in the water for quite some time. I, I think you can infer by the fact that we've called Modesto Police Department that we have not eliminated the fact that it may be a female victim. Investigators have little doubt that these are the bodies of Lacey and Connor Peterson, now missing for almost four months, but they have to be sure. We're conducting tests to determine the identities of the body and also uh, if the two bodies, uh, the one that was found today and the baby from yesterday, are related or not. The body of the baby is found intact. This suggests to the coroner that the baby had been in utero until very recently. The body of the woman is in far worse shape, missing the head and limbs, so identification is incredibly difficult. But she's wearing a nursing bra, another clue that she may be Lacey. Now investigators prepare Lacey's family for these horrific details before they're reported. Then they call Scott. He's nowhere to be found. Were you worried that he was going to flee? After the first body came up, I, I asked the Department of Justice um, to s try to find him. Because uh, we did have a tracker on his truck, and we knew it was down in the San Diego area. But um, we sent, the Department of Justice went out, and they found the truck, and somebody else was driving it. And so I had a fear he was going to flee. On the morning of Wednesday, April 16th, Detective Brokini locates Scott through wiretaps on his cell phone. Scott's been staying in San Diego at a house belonging to the parents of his half-sister, Ann Bird. He was really better than any dope dealer I've ever followed around in my career. I mean, this guy was counter-surveillance savvy and, you know, you really couldn't follow him. Every day, divers are combing the churning waters of the bay, looking for more body parts or any equipment that might have been used to dispose of the body. Scott Peterson is spending his time actively trying to elude the police. He's dyed his hair blonde and grown a thick goatee, but he knows he's being watched everywhere. On April 17th, a warrant is issued. It's time to arrest Scott. But on the morning of April 18th, Detective Brokini is alerted that Scott is playing a very fast game of cat and mouse with the police. It was a wild goose chase. I mean, there were some people almost got in accidents. He was able to elude a helicopter. I mean, it was, he was driving, um, he, almost out of control. Was there a sense in, in following him, wondering whether he would head for the border? Oh, yeah, why would he be driving like that? When he turned into that golf course, maybe it was just to hide out a little while and turn around and head for the border, but lucky for us, we had some unmarked DOJ agents that actually saw him, got on him quick enough, and followed him into that golf course. Modesto police rush to the scene. They arrive at 11.15, and at last, exactly 115 days after Lacey disappeared, after an intense investigation that transfixed the nation, Scott Peterson is formally arrested for the crime of murder. How did he react? To oh, he acted like another day at the park. I mean, he, he stood there, he was calm, he stood there with his sunglasses on and his beard, and I took his photographs and never said nothing to me. It's clear that Scott was planning to go somewhere for quite a while. Investigators search his car and find close to $15,000 in cash, three credit cards, and camping gear. 
but there's more that the public hasn't heard before. One of the things that really wasn't talked about a lot is he also had a couple of neckties in there, some dress shirts, some dress shoes. I mean, he could go from having dinner at a resort, you know, uh, in Acapulco, to camping up in the mountains within about, you know, four hours. Police also find a map of Fresno, where Amber Fry lives and works. Could that be where he was headed next? In hindsight, with all you know, do you think he would have been capable of killing you? You know, I just, I, I really, I don't know. And maybe I don't, I just don't want to, you know, think about that. After his arrest, Scott's placed in leg irons and waist chains for the long ride back north to the Stanislaus County Jail. That was a relatively long ride back from the location of the arrest to, you know, bringing him back up to the jail. What was that like? He sat in the back seat behind me. He was quiet, didn't ask hardly any questions at all. Told him we were probably thinking of hamburgers, an In-N-Out burger. Um, said he'd have a double-double with cheese and a, a fry and a vanilla shake. Kind of like we were coming back from fishing. Now the pieces are falling into place. On the ride back to Modesto, the detectives receive a call. DNA results are complete. The woman's body has been positively identified as Lacey Peterson. The baby is indeed Scott's child. The law requires that the next of kin be notified, and ironically, that person is Scott Peterson, now handcuffed in the back of the police car, charged with their murders. Scott Peterson's much-anticipated trial begins on June 1, 2004, a year and a half since Lacey Peterson was reported missing. The trial is a long and grueling one. Defense counsel Mark Garagos pounds the prosecution as it tries to build its case. He's out to discredit some of the police testimony. I think it is, it's fair to say that Garagos really tried to go after you on a couple of points, and the press picked it up. And you, you were, at least defense was trying to make you out as the bad guy of the case. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult was that? I've been lead detectives on an, a lot of homicides. And to go to court and be in court and know what happens and then to come out, I've never seen anything like it. And see, it's like those reporters were not in the same courtroom I was. It's touch and go at times. But in the end, detectives put together the pieces of the circumstantial puzzle for the jury. On November 12, 2004, almost two years since that Christmas Eve when Lacey Peterson disappeared, the jury returns with its verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Scott Lee Peterson, guilty of the crime of murder of Lacey Denise Peterson. And in the penalty phase, the decision on Scott Peterson's fate is unanimous. Peterson has been sentenced to death for the double murder of his wife and his unborn son, baby Connor. When the verdict came in, I literally was breathless. I mean, I didn't realize how, I mean, it just, it just had an effect. I think we were, were grateful that we'd been able to hold Scott accountable for his actions. I'm proud of the investigation. And I know the department, the other detectives, uh, they, they sacrificed and uh, they do it again. We may never find out what actually occurred in this house on Christmas Eve. There's only one person alive to answer that question. And for now, Scott Peterson is not talking.